acted. I'm Dan Rundy. I hold the Schreier chair here at CSIS. Thanks for joining us today. Um, uh, we're going to be talking about the future of doing business. I would argue that doing business has been one of the most successful initiatives in international development. It's also drawn significant controversy. And so I think, uh, I, I think it was a, a success of the United States in partnering with the World Bank. There were some great uh, great innovators at the time at the World Bank Group. Uh, my, Dr. Michael Klein, who's with us, who was chief economist at the IFC, was part of the original team. Simeon Jankov, who later became finance minister of Bulgaria. Um, there's been, uh, there were a series of sort of intellectual parents of doing business, including the, uh, the Hernando de Soto in Peru, but also there were significant uh, initiatives that AID had been working on since the 1990s, Investor Roadmap, and others that impacted doing business. I think the Bush administration, of which I was a part, provided political cover and financial support to get it stood up. And then folks like Michael Klein and others provided political, technical political cover and, poli and, and political leader and technical leadership to create the doing business indicators. In international development, we talk a lot about what's the future of the World Bank Group. Many people, there's an international development consensus that says um, the World Bank Group should be about global public goods. The World Bank Group should be about data-driven and evidence-based. The World Bank Group should be about policy dialogue. My view is, is like this answers the mail on all of those sorts of things. We talk a lot about we need to have policy dialogue and development. My view is this is the ultimate icebreaker. I'm going to quote uh, Michael Klein's forthcoming paper that will be coming out soon, I promise, Michael. That this is the ultimate policy dialogue icebreaker. Um, I think there have been, there are significant criticisms of doing business. I think we're going to hear about that today. But there's been significant progress. And so one of the questions is, should the, I hope the World Bank continues to do this. I think one of the questions, and I hope that the management will continue to do this, I think as long as doing business exists, it will have serious critics to it. Uh, and so I think it's those that support doing business like myself have to hear those critics. But also I think we have to think about what does that mean in terms of adjustments. So uh, I think we're going to have a very interesting discussion today. Um, I'm really pleased uh, we have a gentleman from the Embassy of Georgia who's going to be with us, who's going to make some opening remarks. Uh, his name is Georgie Sikolia. And uh, he's going to talk specifically about the Georgian experience of doing business, because I think the mo ultimately where this matters isn't about rankings and the what ranking are you not. Is it that change makers like my, my new friend Georgie Sicolia in Georgia or my hero in international development, Dr. Juan Jose Dubu, a former managing director of the World Bank, a former finance minister in El Salvador, who have used, so serious change makers in countries are using these materials to bring about political change. And ultimately, it's not just a technical discussion. There is a political component to this work. You ultimately, it just cannot just be about the metrics and the methodology. There's ultimately, you have to enter the world of politics. So my view is any discussion, the United States, both in the Bush administration, the Obama administration, and I believe now in the Trump administration, both Republican and Democrat, uh, and I think there's been broadly Republican and Democrat support for the doing business indicators. There was a a letter that was signed by Karen Bass, uh, a, significant, a very prominent Democrat. This was in 2013. Ed Royce, I can't remember all of them, but it was like the prominent chair and minority uh, person on the House, in the House and the, in the Senate, I think, of the, of the relevant committees in the United States Congress overseeing the World Bank, who sent a letter to uh, Dr. Jim Kim in 2013 when there was a significant review of doing business saying, Guys, we really like this, so what the heck are you doing? I hope you're not going to like kneecap this or outsource this or kill this. And so um, it was more polite than that, but that was basically the message. So I think there's a broad bipartisan consensus in the United States. Um, so I'm going to leave it at that. I think we're going to have a very robust and interesting conversation. I'm going to first turn, turn the floor to my new friend from the Embassy of Georgia to tell about the Georgian experience. Please welcome my new friend. Thank you. Thanks, Jim. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you, Daniel. It was a great opening, and uh, definitely, yes, I think from today we can call ourselves friends, and we'll have a, a lot of discussions on doing business, and uh, which we started a few minutes back uh, while being introduced to each other. And uh, during the introduction, the first question that I was asked is, what was the change that the doing business brought to Georgia, uh, and how this doing business index in itself is perceived in Georgia? 
and how known is the doing business? And my answer was, if there are a few words that every Georgian household knows, and every Georgian knows in the acronyms, there is a map that stands for Membership Action Plan. This is part of the NATO and the part of the process of becoming the uh, member of the NATO that every Georgian household knows, and the Doing Business Index. This is the index that for the past uh, 15 years, since 2004, uh, has been uh, an index that was a uh, forefront in pushing the uh, economic reform in the country, pushing for the, uh, for the new initiatives, pushing uh, for change. And when we talk about change, probably uh, Georgia would be the best example of how the prudent economic reforms could bring a change to a country where in terms of the legal infrastructure, the physical infrastructure, there was practically non-existing uh, right about at the same time when the Doing Business Index in itself was, um, uh, was, uh, was created. Today, when you look at Georgia, you look at the top 20 countries uh, in a list of doing business, you would see that the majority of them are OECD countries. They're countries with a mid or high income level. And the Georgia, in top 10 of them, is the only country that is a non-OECD member. We're number nine in the world in, in, in those rankings. Uh, and probably in itself, rankings are just a number. But what this number in itself presents behind it? And behind it are the benchmarks, issues such as, first of all, uh, starting the business. Uh, getting the license uh, to, obtain the, um, uh, to obtain a construction permit, registering a property, uh, and doing a lot of other things, protecting minorities or investment investors. For the small countries such as Georgia, uh, that are, whose economy is based on investments and, uh, and overall growth of the investments is the main part of the growth of the economy, it's really important to make sure uh, that there are stable and the strong institutions and the economy in itself is open and integrated to the regional and the world markets. And what the doing business uh, reforms that brought to Georgia, they initiated and they kick-started an overall process of additional reforms that at the end turned Georgia to a regional uh, economic hub. Uh, and being the economic hub is uh, impossible without, first of all, again, being an open market economy, being integrated into the regional and the world markets, and to have a process and to show the stable process of moving forward, uh, and the plan of future uh, developing the country. And I think in this case, when you look at the doing business, and of course there are a lot of controversies, and uh, going back in 2013, when the first change in methodology took place, the major change, of course, are some questions that we were asking ourselves. What is it that we, by looking at this methodology, should learn? What are the changes that we should adopt? And how did it affect an overall uh, process of the uh, growth of the economy? And of course, and the issues that are, again, when it comes to developing country, are quite crucial. The unemployment level, the inequality level, uh, uh, and creation of the jobs. And with Georgia, of course, to a certain level, those questions were answered. But at the same time, as I mentioned in the morning, I think doing business in itself is not a medicine to cure any economy. I think it's just a part of the process that allows the policymakers to move in the right way and by adopting an additional policies uh, make sure that, uh, that the health of the economy and the overall goals that the policymakers have in terms of moving the country forward is achieved. And I think we've been able uh, to, to do that and our aim is to be in uh, number top five in the world, hopefully number one one day. And I think we're getting closer there. If methodology stays the same way, we'll have to change again. And at the same time, if you look at the other, uh, other indices, such as Transparency International Indices, such as uh, Heritage Index on Economic Freedom, you would see that all those indices, after the World Bank indices where the Georgia have moved up, in all of those indices we in parallel have moved up as well. In the Freedom of Economic Index, you will see that Georgia is top 16 in the world, so it's in the top 20 countries. And in the most important part, the disease that uh, we had to fight and having this history of the post-Soviet uh, post legacy is fighting corruption. And I think in this case, uh, what the World Bank did uh, and the reforms that were initiated by the World Bank, they brought uh, a drastic change in overall approaches. Uh, and simplifying the process of doing business and having this model of having the business in Georgia that would be easy, cheap, and fast. Uh, all those, those three main aspects uh, practically eliminated the, the petty corruption in Georgia. And today, uh, if you look again, go back to the indices, you would see that we are ahead of a number of the Eastern and the Western European countries when it comes to the corruption perception. So, I mean, Overall, as a country, we have been satisfied with the process that took place. Of course, 
as I have mentioned, is a part of overall uh, overall agenda. Korean government has a four-point reform plan that additionally uh, creates an incentive uh, for Georgia uh, and for the investors uh, to look at the Georgia as a as a destination for its capital and development. Uh, and I think. Looking forward and using the uh, using the World Bank doing business, and I hope that um, we will move in, be moving up in that rating. I think uh, Georgia will stay in, in, in top of those countries, and I would like to thank everyone who was involved uh, in creating these indices, which have, uh, for us have been a historical change in overall approaches. A lot of policymakers in Georgia have been uh, well have had their first experience in policy making by looking at the World Bank uh, doing in this indices and have been raised on that. So there's a lot of knowledge on that and a lot of trust in the, in the brand name. So uh, thank you and I would look forward to the discussion and thank you for inviting me again. Thank you very much. Okay. All right, I'm gonna have my friend Dr. Rita Romalo come up and, and give a presentation uh, about the state of play of doing business. I think there's a lot to, to share and she's gonna run through it. And, doctor, please come on up. Thank you. Uh, good morning. Thank you all for coming. I think this is a very uh, timely discussion uh, because the doing business has been out for 15 years, so it's a good time to take stock of how it has been used so far, how it has evolved over time, and what's next. So what are the things that going forward we should change, we should keep, so what should be the future of doing business? Um, and uh, I think first let's start by having a uh, a refresher of what exactly is doing business, what it measures. I think it has been um, widely used by many governments and researchers and think tanks, um, but oftentimes many people don't actually, especially the general public, tend to not know actually what doing business is about. They think it's actually bigger than it is, what it is. So doing business is, to some extent, a very simple uh, type of idea is measuring business regulations for a small and medium-sized company, domestic company, so the company that is owned by citizens of that country. So it's not about foreign direct investment, although it has been used in a way to, as, as it was given to some extent in the Georgian example, a way to market a country to show we're welcoming investors, even though the whole focus is all about domestic investment because the, the idea, the premise behind doing business is if the, the market conditions are transparent, equal for everybody, accessible to everybody, the citizens of their country would be, you know, entrepreneurs, would be, would have, would be more easy to create jobs, would be easier to find a job, uh, and so therefore the country could develop itself independently of uh, external uh, investment, although the two things to some extent go together. Um, it's also based on one important aspect that most people also don't realize about doing business is that it's based on standardized uh, case scenarios. And what we mean, we actually are comparing exactly the same transaction across all countries. So we're looking, if you want to start uh, an LLC in Tbilisi or in uh, Paris or in New York, what is the process? And then you can see exactly the same type of LLC, how is it different? Uh, and, uh, and then you can actually compare and realize where conditions for investors are easier or more complicated. It focuses on the major business city of the country, and that in part is because that's where most of the economic activity happens anyway, um, but also um, because uh, a lot of the areas that we measure are also at national level. So the, the, for some of the indicators, the location is less relevant if it is in the business city or not, and also we focus on the formal sector, and that's, I think, one of the criticisms we've been having over the years, especially for developing countries, the informal sector, meaning the companies that are not paying taxes, are not registered, are a very large part of the economy, and why aren't we looking at those? Uh, I think one of the important aspects is that regulations affect the formal sector. So if you're complying with regulations, by definition, you're in the formal sector. So that's why when you address regulations, you can only look at the formal sector. But we are, to some extent, also indirectly looking at the informal sector 
by the fact that the more complicated regulations are, the harder it is for an informal firm to become formal. And we'll see there's research that shows that, and I'll go a little bit over that in, in the next few slides. Uh, but even though we don't address directly the informal sector, to some extent we're addressing it indirectly because we're looking at the conditions that prevent you to become uh, formal company and uh, formal companies tend to be more productive, tend to contribute to taxes and uh, workers tend to have better uh, protections also. Um, and here we'll explain a little bit again still uh, on making clear that, uh, making sure that everybody knows what doing business is about. Here we explain a little bit of what are the different topics. So the way that doing business thinks of the world is looking at the life cycle of a firm. So from start to end, what happens? So the first thing, if you want to start a company, is of course you need a, a, a legal, um, you need to become a legal entity. So you need to register, you need to have a tax number, then you need to hire workers, although the labor uh, market regulations is not, no longer part of the ranking for almost 10 years now. But um, it is also still something that it's measured because it's relevant to firms to figure out what you need to do in order to, um, to hire workers, then you need to find a place where you can actually operate your business. Either you buy property or may want to construct it yourself. Uh, you need to have an electricity connection also because nowadays nothing works without uh, electricity. Uh, you may need finance either to get the location or just to expand your business. And so there we're looking at both the equity market through protecting minority investors, but also the financial market or the credit market through getting credit. Uh, you may be importing and exporting, so being involved in international trade. So we're looking at the logistical process of importing and exporting. Of course, because you're in the formal sector, you also need to pay taxes. So it's important to understand what is the process of paying taxes and how much do you have to pay. And then it's also important in case contracts don't actually uh, um, happen the way they should happen, what is the court system? How, if there's a case of insolvency or even outside of insolvency, if there is a, a contract that doesn't go through, uh, what is the process for that? So, and this has, uh, believe it or not, remained very much stable. So the, the topics other than uh, getting electricity that was added, I think in 2013, uh, as it was mentioned, uh, all the other ones have been uh, stable pretty much throughout the years, even though the, um, the methodology has evolved uh, within those topics. So it's not just uh, about um, uh, the fact that we didn't add any topics, so it was more of uh, expansion of the existing topics. So how has the methodology changes has ha uh, happened over the years? So I think here it's important to understand of the how, why, and what. So basically, what were the methodology changes, how they have uh, been uh, done, and why did we embark on the, this uh, two, three-year process of methodology changes in the past five years? So the, the how was basically most of the methodology changes actually took two years to uh, happen. So first, there's a pilot to try to figure out what are the areas that make sense to expand, what a, how the data looks like. There's a preliminary publishing of data so countries and researchers can comment on the data, and then we actually incorporate. So that's the process. The why did we do the methodology changes? So in um, 2012, uh, there was a, the, the president of the World Bank commissioned a panel on doing business to understand, uh, in part because there was, a, a, I think as it was mentioned before, doing business has been a controversial product throughout the, the years. And so different shareholders of the bank were saying, okay, this needs to be reviewed. We need to have an external review of uh, what is the usefulness, is it on target, are we looking at the right things in doing business. So uh, Dr. Kim uh, constituted this panel who was shared by Trevor Manuel, who's a, a former uh, finance minister of South Africa. And they basically looked at all the indicators, uh, how the project have involved, and they had a few recommendations, and we also list their all the other panel members, which had you know, a wide um, geographical spread. So they were of pretty much, I think, representing all large countries. And there were some were academics, some were uh, policy makers, some were more on the business private sites, uh, side of things, uh, private sector side of things. So there was a, 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 it was a very diverse uh, panel. And then uh, they issued their recommendations in 2013, and then there was a discussion uh, around them, and there was a decision of what recommendations to take on board and which ones 
uh, to not. I think there were a few uh, recommendations that were quite important there, and some were uh, taken on board, some were not. Uh, one, there was definitely uh, uh, one important recommendation that uh, bank management decided to not take on board was uh, the panel recommended uh, not to have the rankings at the aggregate level, only at the topic level. But bank management decided, given that it's such an important policy tool, an icebreaker, as Michael Klein mentioned, in policy discussions, um, I think there was a decision that we want to keep this independently of the panel recommendation, but all the other ones were by and large taken on board. So one of the recommendations was to expand the geographical coverage of doing business, and doing, and doing business expanded that within countries, so for the largest countries, we cover more than one city. We cover two cities for the largest countries. There was also uh, the, um, the recommendation to go beyond just the efficiency of regulations, because one of the criticisms was, of the panel was that doing business was looking too much at or just focusing mainly on uh, the negative effects of regulation and not the positive effects of regulation. So a lot of the expansion in methodology was due to that, was to looking at the quality, what are the good things of um, of regulations, and so the, as a result, basically this is the answer to the what changed. Pretty much all the topics have changed over a, a period of three years. So as I mentioned, we added the second CD, and even though we didn't uh, eliminate the aggregation, we actually changed the calculation of the aggregation. So that was, to some extent, the middle point between uh, uh, the panel recommendation, and so we acknowledge that maybe we should compute the ranking differently, but there was still the decision to keep the ranking. Um, and uh, so we expanded in all the topics, and mainly the, the flavor of the expansion was to look not just at um, the efficiency of regulations, but also the quality. So one typical example would be, for instance, in registering property that traditionally we're just measuring the steps, time, and cost to transfer property between one company and another. And now we're also looking at how does the land registry work. So at the end of the day, once you have that title of property, does it have any value? Or is it just a fake title because there's 300 other people with the same title and you really don't have any clarity over property rights in that country? So that's the, the addition part that we had. So just doing it fast was not sufficient. One of the interesting things, because this, to some extent, uh, this expansion answered a few uh, research questions of what is the value of the quality of regulations beyond the efficiency, and do they go together or not? What does, uh, does it add to the efficiency? And one of the things that we saw is that, by and large, there's uh, the, the two go together. So countries that are more efficient tend to also be better in quality, and countries that are slower also tend to not provide. So uh, countries that take forever to do a property transfer are also the ones where the land registry is not working properly. There's no security of titles. Uh, so that the issue of being fast and bad didn't really happen. It was rel very infrequent. Either you're good and fast or you're bad and slow, basically. That's what we uh, saw most uh, across um, uh, most topics. So how, how, what can we learn from the data uh, so far? So what are the, beyond the changes, uh, throughout the years we've been measuring the reforms, how people have been using or governments have been using the report, um, and there we, we see that throughout the years, um, we, um, we've seen you know, over 3,000 reforms. So reforms are basically changes in the data that we can link to a policy change from a government. So there's a conscious decision to improve this process or to change a law. Uh, that would then uh, be reflecting in doing business. Of course, a lot of these reforms could have happened independently of doing business existing. So it's not a question of did doing business make this, the reforms happen or not, but it, it shows that this is a relevant area that countries care about, countries are trying to improve in this area. And of course, the important, the, one of the good news, although of course the, co the composition of each region in terms of number of countries varies, so um, so these are not, the, the, a higher number doesn't necessarily mean a higher percentage, but uh, what we do see is that in sub-Saharan Africa, that's the highest number of reforms. 
And this has evolved over time. So initially, when we started measuring doing business, it was less than a third of the economies in Africa that actually did reforms that could be captured in doing business. And now it's uh, over 70% that actually do. So that, that, that percentage more than doubled uh, that do at least one reform that it's captured in doing business. So we actually see that uh, countries that need reform the most are the ones that are actually uh, making most of those reforms, and the next cha uh, chart shows you the same in a different way. Uh, so basically here we see what is the improvement in the distance to frontier. So the distance to frontier is just basically a metric that shows you how far you are from the best practices. So how far you are from uh, being the fastest country in starting a business or in getting a construction permit. Uh, and, and there, um, and where 100 is the best and zero is the worst, um, and there what we can see is that Euro Europe and Central Asia, although these are the bank definitions, so Europe and Central Asia actually means Eastern Europe and Central Asia, so it doesn't include Western Europe. It's the region that over time has improved the most. So when we look at the different blocks of years, they consistently have improved. They probably improved the most in the earlier years of doing business, so they're probably the initial takers of this type of data and using this data for, to inform reform. Um, but they have improved across all regions, compared to all the regions of the world, they have significantly improved the most. And actually, when we compare the average rank or the average score of Eastern Europe and Central Asia over the 15 years, we actually do see that they jumped a few regions. So they used to be worse than East Asia Pacific. Uh, and uh, even at some point, MANA used to have a, a slightly better uh, <laughs> result in them in certain areas, and now they are the second region after high-income OECD countries. So they, and they are very close, so they're pretty much catching up with uh, uh, high-income OECD countries. So there's less of a difference between the two regions. And then the second region with the highest improvement has been Sub-Saharan Africa. And there, in fact, it's because that's where improvement is the most needed. And um, there, even though it continues to be the region with the lowest average score, we do see a very significant improvement over time. And the high-income OECD countries are the ones that improve the list, but that's not necessarily bad news. It's just these are the countries that are at the top already, so there's much less room for improvement. So that's why you wouldn't expect them to be um, improving that much, but I think it's still a positive news, the fact that they actually have been improving, that they, they do care about this area and they continue improving. And when we look across the 10 different uh, topics, you can see which areas have more reforms, which areas there's bigger changes. And it's interesting that the ones that are about the transactions, the, the steps, time, and cost to complete the transaction in general have the highest uh, impact and highest uh, reform uptake. So starting a business is by far the topic that it's more popular for reform and where countries have tried to simplify the process the most. And then enforcing contracts is at the bottom, mainly because it's very hard to reform your judicial system. So how the courts work, it's a much more complicated and takes longer time. So it's not necessarily that it's less important in any way, it's just that the effort needed, so some of the aspects of which, uh, which areas have bigger uh, reform impact uh, has also to do with the fact that uh, some are much harder to complete um, than others. And um, looking a little bit of how does this mean in more concrete uh, terms, so just to give you a few examples of what we have measured over this 15 years so you can see the, the impact at least on the data and then I'll go more into the impact on economic variables. But uh, for instance, uh, China uh, reduced the, the, the time to complete uh, all the tax formalities by almost 75%. Belarus in uh, registering property went to f from 230 days to three days now. Uh, in construction permitting, Mexico also had a, a, a large improvement and reduced the time in half. So we do see, and these are just a few examples, but for almost every country you can find an area where they actually improve significantly in the areas uh, measured um, in doing business. And here that's uh, what this, uh, uh, this improvement looks like when you look across all the countries. So, and this reflects also the fact that, for instance, starting a business is one of the areas with the highest improvement. So this, what it shows is, 
the red line is basically the evolution of the average time in the worst quartile. So the worst 25% of the countries, the countries that take the longest to start a business or to, or the, the, this, uh, so actually it's cost, so sorry. So the ones that cost the most to start a business or cost the, the highest to register property, uh, this is the average cost for the countries at the bottom. And then the blue line is the average cost for the 75 at the top, the 75% at the top. So the, the three best quartiles. And you see there's a convergence. So the, the ones at the bottom are lowering their cost and making it closer to what the best practices are. And you can still see that even the ones at the best level are actually still improving. So everybody's improving, but the, the ones at, um, at the bottom are improving more. So things are converging and uh, countries are becoming more equal to some extent when it comes to business regulations. Of course, there's still a lot of room to go in. There's still a lot of variation across countries, but that's one of the uh, interesting findings when you look at the 15 years of data. Uh, another important thing is how does this, how does doing business and the results link to uh, economic variables and link to research? So I think there's two levels of research that has been done. One is more the cross-country type of correlations, and this is an example which is linking uh, basically what is the average, which, which is the correlation between scores and uh, different economic variables, and here is the example of corruption. So we see countries that score better in doing business also have lower levels of corruption. Uh, and we see this as being a pattern across all in income levels. So it's not just driven by a group of countries, but it is a, a, a global pattern. And then there's another type of research that it's more trying to establish some level of causality, because with correlation, you don't know what comes first, if it's because they're less corrupt that they have better business regulations, or it's because they have better business regulations, therefore they're less corrupt. So this is just things that we know, we observe that they go together, but it doesn't necessarily mean that one causes the other. But then there are uh, academic papers that use doing business data or have uh, study the areas covered in doing business that show a bit, uh, and here it's a bit uh, wordy, so just to give you a, a few examples, um, that show what is the impact of reform. So once you reform in doing business, what are the consequences that you get? And I think this is probably one of the biggest value added of doing business. Of course, uh, one is definitely being used for policy discussion and to uh, uh, instigate reform, but I think that this aspect of research, because that is somewhat crucial to doing business because doing business comes from research and ends in research in the sense that the choice of topics, how they were designed, were based on research, were based on economic theory. So uh, starting a business is about the entering a market. So the competition regulations, competition theory, uh, protecting minority investors about gov corporate governance issues, which are well studied in economic literature. Uh, enforcing contracts is about the completeness of contracts. So they all have a link to economic theory somehow as some, you know, something that we're trying to test and understand what is the relevance of this in practice. So it's important that once the data is published, it's also being used to actually test those things and see, do those, uh, do, does the data validate the, the type of uh, theory that it was based upon when, when it was uh, designed? So one, one aspect, and I guess probably Miriam would discuss more because she has done uh, lots of research on that, is the link with firm entry. So once you simplify firm entry, do you actually see more businesses being started? Do you actually see more uh, uh, jobs uh, being created. And there is uh, some positive stories there, some uh, positive impact, although, of course, starting a business is not the only thing that is important to firms. Uh, you know, paying taxes down the road, the importing and exporting process is also crucial uh, down the road. There's also a lot of analysis uh, related to credit market regulations. Does the existence of a credit bureau matter uh, or a um, a collateral registry, does it matter also for, for financial inclusion and also for the firm uh, being able to have access to credit? So there are several examples of things that link the doing business indicators with uh, significant economic um, impact. And now the future. So I think the, uh, the future is uh, um, something that, of course, it's uh, yet to be defined, um, but there are like there's uh, an important trade-off that uh, we've learned from the recent methodology changes, but I think we've knew it before. Is that there are different um, directions that we can go. One 
is keep the, the report stable, not make any changes, and so people, so it's more predictable, and in general, people like predictability, but then it may reduce its relevance going forward because the world evolves, so the, the problems for firms become different over time. And so there's this trade-off between adding new things, expanding the things that we have, and uh, consistency over, over time. And actually, as, uh, as I'm sure many of you uh, know, recently the whole controversy about doing business was about the motivation between the, um, the methodology changes, um, and specifically on Chile, and where now the, the bank decided, okay, let's do an audit on the Chile data, even though all the, the, um, the claims were retracted afterwards, there, it's still there is that need of, did we do the methodology changes the right way? What was the right process? Can we improve on that process? So one of the things that we're actually looking at now is what is the right process for future methodology changes if we do any in the future? And so that's why when I present this part on the future of doing business, it should be taken with a grain of salt in the sense that uh, the process is still out there to be defined, and that's one of the things that we hope this auditing process will help the bank or guide the bank in the right direction of what is the right process for future methodology changes if we want to go in that direction. But uh, the two areas that we're uh, considering now to expand on doing business, and they will not be in any way in the immediate future, so these are things for two years, three years down the road. Uh, one is public procurement. So one of the areas that we've been uh, getting comments from many people over time is that there's a crucial part of interactions between government and firms that we're not covering, which is public procurement. So here what we're trying to address is a simple, uh, road construction. So what is the process? Where can the contract fail and create opportunities for corruption? So that's basically what we're trying to capture in this uh, public procurement indicator. So this is uh, the different stages of the public procurement, per, procurement cycle that we're considering. And the other area that we're also looking at, and this has a lot to do with what is relevant for businesses today, is trying to look at regulations that affect operating in the digital economy. So in and there we identified four areas, and this is very much at pilot stages, so this is probably something that we may have something to show in two, three years' time, but not any time soon. But one of the important areas, so if you're selling on the internet or through the internet, you need a good payment system, which doing business doesn't cover in any of the other topics, but it's crucial nowadays, even for firms that don't operate online, payment systems are, are, are crucial because no one pays anything in cash anymore, so uh, even in developing countries. Then also the logistics for e-commerce, so doing business looks at the logistics for importing and exporting, but doesn't look at the logistics within a city so, or within a country. So that aspect, it's also uh, become crucial especially with the evolution towards uh, selling more things through the internet, but even if you're not through the, selling through the internet, it's still important. And so, and of course, internet connectivity and the regulatory framework for the internet, those are areas that we are exploring and considering for the future, but there it's still, you know, as I said, the, uh, the, it's still out to be figured out what would be the process and what would be the exact timeline for those changes, and with that, I thank you for, for the presentation, and I probably took too long. <laughs> I'm sorry. Thank you, Rita. I'm going to ask the panelists to come up. Please join me up here. I'm, I'm going to turn the floor over to my friend and colleague, Ramina Bendur, who's a senior fellow here. Uh, and I think we're going to have a chance to unpack further these issues, so thank you. But I think it was important that we... we contextualize the conversation with those introductory presentations. Okay, Romina, I'm going to turn the floor over to you. Well, thank you everybody for, for being here um, and thank you for, for this excellent panel that we have today. Uh, we have Miriam Brown, she's Senior Economist in the Development Research Group at the World Bank Group. Juan Jose Dabub is former Minister of Finance of El Salvador and former Managing Director of the World Bank Group. Michael Klein is former Vice President for Financial and Private Sector Development at the World Bank Group. And Justin Sanderfer, he's Senior Fellow at the Center for Global Development. Uh, I'd like to start with the policy icebreaker question. Uh, what has the doing business um, 
index accomplished in the past 15 years in your view? And maybe we can start with Michael. My personal perspectives on this are a little bit like this. I worked on issues of business regulation for several decades, and in the, starting in the 1980s. And when you worked on, I remember one country example, I'll not name the country, but uh, you would discuss, for example, how long does it take to enforce a court order uh, to see whether people uh, can get their property rights respected or their contracts are respected. And then uh, you would find out that there are so many cases in court, so many held up, take so long on average, et cetera, that people claim. And then you argue that's too long. And then they say, how can you say that is too long? Because we'll give you 5,000 reasons why all of these things have to be done the way they're, have to, they're done. Uh, and it's very hard to argue uh, about what is good practice, what is best practice, if you just work case by case. You need a lot of exposure to different places. And you need to be able to summarize this and confront it with each other. You need to be able to benchmark. So that is one thing. The second thing is business regulation is kind of a boring topic. It's called red tape. This is kind of more exciting, but mostly the color that evokes in my mind is gray. You know, lots of bureaucrats and regulators being at, at work. It's very hard to get political excitement about this. And there's also a lot of it is complex. In the EU, the so-called uh, acquis communautaire, the kind of rule set you have to work yourself through if you want to become a member of the EU, comprises arguably something in the order of 14,500 different rules and regulations that you have to sort through and have to look at to make your own country com regulations compatible with. That's kind of really complex no? and, and boring. How do you summarize this? How do you create summary measures that convey, at least directionally, a sense of where the country stands or where it's going? These are the kind of uh, background experiences that led me to embrace the idea that one should measure what governments make, the rules that they make, find a way of benchmarking this, and summarize it in some in some form or fashion to increase the salience of this in political debate and to give a tool for people who are analyzing in country and outside of the countries uh, to, to better, to have a more constructive dialogue about all of this stuff. So I think that has actually happened beyond the expectations at, at the beginning. Um, that there is any country, whether it's Georgia or as we've heard before or, or whoever, where lots of people know what doing business is and care about regulations in some sense they're about, that's, I find amazing. Uh, we have, a, the doing business team has been tracking for several years how many reforms have been done that are captured by the indicators. If I recall, the number is a little bit over 3,000 since the creation of the doing business project. And as best as one can tell, this is a judgment, something a little over 900 of them of these reforms have actually been shaped or influenced to some degree by the existence of doing business and by the debates ar around this. And I can, I, I, that sounds plausible to me from the experiences that I had myself in dealing with this. So I would think uh, this is a system that gives salience to something that is important uh, and uh, in, in a way that I had not, certainly me, had, had not expected. And that's sort of a, a, a slightly personal perspective on why this is important or what it has achieved. Maybe Miriam, uh, from your, your point of view. Um, okay, so thank you for having me. So I'm a, I'm a researcher at the World Bank and work on um, private sector issues. And for me, so when I was in grad school you know, over 10 years ago, sort of, um, this whole discussion about why are some countries richer than others, there was this new element that people started thinking about, which was institutions, the concept that institutions matter. But that's a very nebulous concept, and it's not clear how to measure it. And back then, it was really, there was not much out there that sort of you could use to measure it, and it was just sort of an area where work was just starting. And doing business, I think, is a pioneer in that. I mean, it was one of the first ways we had to to measure institutions in the sense of regulation or you know, government processes that, that are important for firms and, and private sector development. 
And um, I think the uh, doing business um, measures have really spurred a lot of research in this area, and they've provided a framework for thinking about, well, you know, what are the procedures that firms deal with? What, wh how much time does it take? What's the cost? And that has really led to a lot of research in these areas, which in part has shown that improving these kinds of procedures does lead to more job creation or more firm creation. And, and it's really something that we know a lot more about now than we did 15 years ago. And in part, I think that is due to doing business. Because I, something else that I didn't realize when I started to work on this area of private sector development is that there's much less data compared to, you know, if you think about education or health. I mean, there's a lot of measures of, you know, uh, human development and things like that. Um, but in, in the private sector area, it's really much harder to sort of measure things and to come up with ways of comparing countries and so on. So I think that's really a contribution that doing business has made. And I realize that a lot of the controversies are around the index and around comparing countries, but from the research perspective, what's even more useful is sort of the, the components of the index, like the, the granular measures of how long does it take to do this or that procedure. And, and those are the things that I think we use most often in research. And, um, and that is really something that before doing business didn't exist. And I, I sort of uh, adding to what Michael said is, uh, I did my thesis, my, my uh, <clears throat> doctoral thesis on, uh, on the effect of, this, of doing business reform in Mexico, starting business reform in Mexico, and I remember going to the agency there that was in charge of improving regulation, and they pulled out like the research paper by Jankov and co-authors that first measured, you know, uh, what are the procedures for doing business in different countries, and they were saying, look, we're not doing that well. Like, we had no clue that we were this bad in a sense, we need to improve. And, and that is a tool I think that, as Michael said before, sort of didn't really exist. I mean, in a country maybe you knew, okay, these were the procedures, but is this good, is this bad, how does this compare, how can we improve, is something that before doing business uh, was much harder to, to judge or I think countries just didn't really know. And so, I, I mean, that's sort of what I have to say. Hi, thanks. Um, so I think the World Bank Research Department is one of the premier institutions in the world for generating knowledge on development and the data that they produce is vital to my work and to the development sector as a whole. Um, and I agree with everything Miriam said about the usefulness of that granular data on regulations for doing real research in this sector. Um, but in terms of what is the index, what is the doing business report accomplished, I'd step back with a very short story, which is, Several years ago, I was living in Tanzania, in Dar es Salaam. Um, and as anybody who's been to Dar knows, Dar has been in this construction boom. You know, when I got to Dar, there were no tall buildings except for the central bank, and suddenly it's full of high rises. And this horrible thing started to happen when I was living in Dar, which is that these buildings started to fall down. Shoddy construction, fraud, et cetera, high rise buildings started to collapse. And in 2013, this kind of uh, came to an apex with the collapse of a 16 story building, which dozens of people died from the collapse of this building. And at the time, if you looked at the Doing Business Index for construction, you would have said to improve its regulatory environment, what Tanzania needed to do was make it easier, cheaper, and faster to get construction permits. Now, to my mind, that's just dangerous and kind of malpractice in terms of a research output. Uh, the Trevor Manual Commission came out in 2013 said you need to add you know, quality of regulation components. I think the team has done great work. I applaud most of the methodological changes that have made in that time. We're getting to a more balanced view of what you need to do. I still don't think we're there yet. Um, but I think while the underlying data has been super useful, the use of the report and the rankings to push countries in a given direction, I still don't know that Tanzania moving up in the rankings in the construction indicator would be good for the world. And that's something that the Trevor Manual Commission was very kind of clear about. There is no normative ranking here. There is no up to this index. It is not that by going up, we're in a better policy position. This is useful data, which researchers like Miriam should use to analyze given reforms, but it's not a ranking in a normative sense that we know that one is better. And so I think, what has the report accomplished? It's kind of dumbed down the conversation of doing serious policy analysis around business regulation and thinking seriously about this topic. 
Thank you. Dr. Dabub, you were um, former finance minister of El Salvador. How did you use uh, the doing business indicators in your day-to-day -day job? And what other type of indices or data or policy tools did you have out there that you, you know, your government was looking at? So El Salvador uh, is a country that went from hardship to investment grade in a relatively short period of time and also in a relatively short period of time, we lost it afterwards. And one can clearly see the period when uh, reforms were taking place uh, in the right direction, and when that stopped and a different model was adopted. So I was in government for 12 years without belonging to any political party then or now, and worked for three different governments. Uh, and the doing business came towards the end of my 12 years. Before that, uh, we had to rely on the credit rating agencies uh, and on the uh, index of economic freedom, which was out there already, and uh, I believe also the competitiveness indicator that Michael Porter puts together. So there were some tools there uh, that we were able to use in order to uh, persuade especially the legislators uh, to uh, approve uh, the legislation that would remove obstacles for people to take destiny into their own hands. And in the same way that Justin gave an example, let me give you mine. El Salvador had f a, a 5% of its population killed during the war and about 22% of the population left the country, migrated primarily to the United States. 90% uh, of our infrastructure was destroyed, and our credibility was zero. In 1992, we signed a peace agreement. We adopted a model, of basically, of economic freedom without really using labels, we just knew that we needed to do something that will get us closer to what at that time we saw as good models on the economic front, Singapore, Chile, Australia, New Zealand, Ireland. Um, and we embarked in a process of removing those obstacles and to opening up our economy. And from 49% extreme poverty, we went to 19%, so more than half uh, was cut, uh, from three telephones to 150 telephones per 100 inhabitants. And in the years 2000 and 2001, again, this is based on uh, the index of economic freedom, we were able to beat, we were number 13 in the world, we were able to beat Chile, Germany, Spain, South Korea, and several other developed countries, which show that we were not Switzerland, we were not yet a developed country, but we were in the right direction. When the doing business came, it helped facilitate the dialogue with, especially with Congress. In our case, the 12 years that I was in government, the opposition party, which is now in power, and is basically uh, a communist government, they were very much against all of these reforms, and they were the majority. So as opposed to Singapore and Chile, where you do, where at the time you didn't have a democracy, when you have a democracy, you have to be able to persuade and convince the opposition that is at the end going to vote in favor or, of, or against of particular legislation. So we started to use the doing business again, as I said, the last few years. And then when I came uh, to the World Bank, I was responsible for 110 countries, basically all of the Middle East, all of North Africa, uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, Asia and, and Latin America. So basically only Eastern Europe was not part of my portfolio. And the dialogue, every time I would go to the countries, and I visit 70 of them in the four years that I was at the bank, uh, the dialogue, I always prefer to start it by uh, uh, showing where the country was in the doing business report. Uh, and some countries didn't like it, others appreciated a lot. At the end of the day, an index, such as the doing business, is not a thermometer that tells us the temperature or a watch that tells us the time.
It is more of a navigation chart which points in a particular direction, and hopefully you have the leadership in the countries, like we did for a period of time, that actually do want to empower people, do want to remove obstacles for people to take destiny into their own hands, and the results show it by reducing poverty by half, by uh, having almost, and in some cases, more than 100% coverage in terms of public services, and you do it with more transparency, you do it in a more, I would say, with equal access to opportunities. We still have a lot of work to do in many of our countries, but I think at the end of the day, it is important for the policy discussion, it is important uh, for uh, encourage competition between countries. You know, we used to look at what Costa Rica was doing, not what Chile was doing, and we was like, come on, we are 10 points behind or 10 uh, 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 positions uh, uh, behind, and, and that will help us uh, create healthy competition internally to move in what we consider at the time to be the right direction. Thank you. I wanted to um, go back to um, now Justin's points about the limitations of doing business. Um, what do you think are the main limitations of the tool, and do you think that um, the doing business should go out of business? Um, so, Justin, the floor is yours. Um, okay. Um, I would go back to the 2013 uh, independent review of the doing business indicators uh, that Rita mentioned in her presentation that I mentioned before, led by Trevor Emanuel. Um, you know, the, the kind of headline recommendations of that independent commission were one, doing business should continue to exist in some form, uh, and that the country rankings should not. Right. As Rita mentioned, World Bank management um, stepped back from that. Um, I, I disagree with that choice. I think the recent controversies kind of show the danger of these rankings becoming kind of a political marketing tool at the expense of the rigor of the underlying um, research. Um, that report made a number of recommendations, some of which were embraced, to continue to exclude the employment uh, indicators from the overall index, so the countries aren't punished for having a minimum wage or union protections. They recommended dropping the tax rate as an indicator, which still hasn't been done. I know it's been modified. Um, but the, the underlying reason that the, that the Trevor Manual Commission gave for wanting to remove the aggregate rankings, um, I still think not only has that recommendation not been embraced, but the underlying spirit of it hasn't been embraced either. Um, and there, you know, to read from their recommendations, it was that doing business is not a tool that should be routinely used to shape policy reforms in countries. And, you know, we brought together an eminent group of policymakers and researchers, and the conclusion was this is not a guide for policy. And it continues to be used in the marketing of the report as a guide for policy. And I think that's where we get into real dangers. Lots of interesting research we can do with it. Keep generating the data, yes, but putting it forward as a tool for guiding policy, I think, is dangerous. The Chile example, you know, to go back, you know, this is awkward and uncomfortable, but, you know, there was reference to all of the kind of, you know, Paul Romer made these blockbuster allegations about he'd lost faith in the doing business ranking, lost faith in the integrity of the rankings in the pages of the Wall Street Journal. Um, and, you know, I think it's important to divide what Paul Romer said into two categories of things. One was some very specific allegations about how the rankings had been changed or were being compared over time in incomparable ways. And the other was a whole set of conspiracy theories about the political motivations for the changes. That latter set of allegations was withdrawn, I, as far as I know, rightly so. I think his resignation came as a result of that. Jim Kim accepted his resignation. We still haven't heard a real answer as to the changes why we're comparing apples and oranges over time, because the methodology is changing over time, and we're still seeing comparison of the rankings over time. Chile is not the worst example in my view. I've said this you know, in public before. I think what's happened in India, where the doing business ranking has become such a partisan political tool, there's been revisions to the indicators. Those comparisons that the prime minister is tweeting out that the World Bank is issuing press releases about are comparing apples and oranges. It's in the bank country office's interest, perhaps, to have a good relationship with the government? I don't know. I shouldn't speculate. But it's undermining this, you know, the political use of the rankings is undermining, I think, the integrity of the underlying project. 
Yeah, just a slightly different take on this. Uh, first, on the, the nature of the data and the dumbing down argument. Um, I quite disagree with this on the following grounds. The, um, the original spirit of doing business was to see whether simpler, faster, less costly would actually be correlated with better outcomes overall or worse outcomes. There was never an assumption that less is automatically good. You have to show that less goes together with good. So in the original papers, all the research, when you look at it, start from the assumption that you're doing business measures, measure high and low on some scale of complexity, but whether high and low corresponds to good or bad is a matter for research. The original research papers tried to establish that. That's why the doing business indicators were designed the way they were. And in the very first one on business registration, a lot of people said, if we don't have more complex business registration, we get all sort of fly-by-night operators, uh, people who shouldn't be there, people who do damage to this, that, and the other. The same argument with construction licenses, et cetera. And then you find out when you actually have indicators, you need two sets of indicators. You need what is the bureaucratic process, and you need an indicator on the quality of the outcome. Uh, and then you need to see how does the process relate to the outcome. If you mix the two, you're on a slippery slope. It's not helpful. Uh, the same goes, by the way, for labor regu uh, regulation. Labor market flexibility is what is being measured, but the issue is then, will actually people be employed? That is one, one outcome. The second, will they have a safety net, uh, and will they have the kinds of protections that are there in the, in the labor standards of, of the ILO, for example? So putting this all in one indicator is not the solution. The, the solution is to, to study whether high and low corresponds to good or bad, and where it does, uh, to act uh, accordingly. And so that's the spirit of the doing business uh, indicators. I would think the dumbing down is by those people who automatically believe that more complex and more detailed regulation is actually leading to the, the stated desired outcome. It doesn't. So uh, that's my basic view on, on, on that one. And so that calls for continuous research uh, to, to try and see how these relationships uh, evolve between high and low and good and bad. But the, the ant in terms of direction for the future for doing business, that means not to merge outcome measures with the current indicators, but to complement the current indicators with outcome measures and to help inform the policy debate. So that's one. The second is on the rankings. The idea that doing business should not be routinely used as a tool to make to help policy make policy. I thought, why is that a good idea? All indicators are supposed to do to, to inform policy making. So should doing business. Why shouldn't that be used as a as a as a tool? I just don't get it. Uh, and so the, the rankings themselves, in any kind of benchmarking system, automatically involves ranking. There's no way around that. You can let other people. Be, in the first three years of doing business, there was no international ranking. Uh, between the, 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 the different countries. So people went out and did it themselves. So we had articles where people said, if you take this and we make a ranking out of it, this is what it looks like. The rankings are out there as soon as we have a data set like that. And so what, what the rankings have done is they have given political salience to this by the same token political criticism, but that's just what you have to deal with and then bring it down to a better debate. At the end of the day, in all countries I have been involved with, I'm, I'm out of the bank for nine years now, so you know, I haven't followed the battle hill to hill uh, in recent times. But in all the debates that I've been involved with, there's no automatic mechanical use of doing business because there are so many interest groups inside the countries uh, that are invested in the current regulations that there is no simple policy process that says, oh, we'll take doing business as the gospel and that's where we'll go it all comes down to enhancing the intensity of discussion at the end of the day, that is a good thing. Brief response there. I think we're getting somewhere. I liked what you said that we need to show that less regulation is good, not just assume that less regulation is good. And I think that's where we're on the same page. I know a number of papers have tried to do that. And I think again, the Trevor Manual Commission was pretty clear uh, that the empirical, the quote, empirical evidence on the results of business regulation reforms captured by the report is mixed and suggestive at best. 
So we've measured the right-hand side variable. We want to know whether the right-hand side variable generates some sort of improvement in outcomes on the left-hand side. That research is inconclusive at this point. There were some papers that have found positive results, others that haven't, but it's mostly, as, as the commission said, re cross-country regressions that don't establish causality, right? And in the meantime, the bank is saying, you know, that there is a ranking here. Uh, we're talking about there's lots of room to go in countries and improving. Uh, there are cases of this index and improvement on the index being used as the basis for loan conditionality. So it's not that the bank is being agnostic saying, here's some interesting data. Why don't you use it as the basis to have a policy conversation? No, no. This is a pretty blunt instrument. This is loan conditionality based on your improvement on this index. So we're putting the cart before the horse. We've measured the right-hand side variable, and now we're making loans conditional on you improving that right-hand side variable before we've showed that it leads to any development outcomes. I would think the, the evidence is a little bit better than that. So all the doing business indicators, the initial ones that were put together were based on peer-reviewed international research. This is the strongest kind of data that you have for linking the nature of regulation to outcomes. If, if you want to look at the economics profession as a whole and say, is there anything that economists agree on totally? No, there isn't. Let's move on to a more optimistic um, question. What do you see the, uh, the doing business uh, shaping in the future, five to 10 years from now? What, what are the new directions that you would like doing business to go to? And maybe we can start with Miriam. Um, so I think um, one um, thing that would be nice to have is even um, sort of more data for each country so where you, I, there are some countries where there's subnational doing business, so where you have sort of at the region level or the state level different um, doing business measures. I think that that has been extremely useful for research and the more we can have of that and, and the more often, I mean, over time and, and, and in more countries, this, this will be extremely useful. And um, also, I mean, I, I think also for the research perspective to some extent, continuity is important. So these changes are not that helpful if you're trying to analyze things over time and then things change, so that, that always adds uh, complications. So either to sort of have things be consistent or if they're not to sort of go back and try to adjust previous data so that it is comparable over time would be useful. But um, I also think that um, this discussion of, yeah, I mean, so there's some areas clearly where there's benefits for business, but downsides for other actors for, you know, maybe safety or, or labor or e even with the taxes, government needs to collect taxes, but the lower the tax rates are the better for firms. So there's always trade-offs. And I think to some extent, that's also why most of the reforms have been in the starting a business um, area, because that's a bit most straightforward, I think, where there's sort of fewer potential downsides of, of making it easier to start a business. And I know governments, for example, in Mexico, they're sort of the easy procedure for businesses that are what they call low risk. And then if you're going to be selling alcohol or producing chemicals or things like that, well, then you still have extra procedures. So there's even some disaggregation like that going on. So I, I would also not um, not necessarily say that, you know, this issue of, well, there, there can be some dangers that that precludes the whole exercise from being useful. Um, so I, I would like to basically see it continue, particularly the, the micro level data with the rankings. I'm not sure. I mean, I see how it can be useful from, you know, the overall perspective of com comparing things. but. Um, even with the, 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 the microdata, we do that oftentimes for, you know, reports or, or motivating different projects that the World Bank does. We say, okay, let's look at, you know, the getting credit indicators. How does this country compare? So there's no credit bureau here. There's no collateral registry, things like that. And then you sort of use that to start the discussion or to make the case, well, this is an area where we should be looking at. And that, that doesn't necessarily uh, imply having the overall ranking, but I see how maybe at the broader political level that could be useful. Um, but I mean, I, my strongest feelings are just about continuing the underlying data and expanding it at the region level. And I, I, if that stopped, I think it would be very sort of <laughs> sad <laughs> and a step back from where, where we have gone in terms of generating more data on private sector research. Juan Jose, your thoughts? Yeah, so um, I am an engineer, not an economist, 
uh, and that means I like exact things. So two plus two needs to be equal to four, not on the other hand, like, like some of my friend economists do. Uh, I come from the private sector and have several businesses in Latin America and was in government and at the World Bank. And what I can say is that it's not about how much more to improve this navigation chart, but rather what do countries really need to do in order to further uh, you know, increase the benefits for as much people as possible. And if we look at it that way, we will see that several countries, including mine, but several countries have gone through a pendulum where they have a few years of progress in a particular direction and then they come back. There are others that on the economic front, like Chile, the swings have basically are non-existent or are little compared to other areas, but there are still a few countries that are still facing that pendulum. So rather than asking for more, what else, what bells and whistles do we have? I would make it even simpler. I would make it something that even the most common uh, uh, person, which now has a lot of access to information, can influence the decision makers in the country. So I will make it simpler and not more complex. And as it is the case, I left the bank in 2010, as it is the case, I understand the bank is exploring doing other indicators for other things. So that's fine, do other for other things, but keep, if you want, the virginity of this, uh, because it did prove to do good, and because many of, many of the countries out there are still facing this pendulum and need to go to some very basic things. Also, one more comment. Regrettably, because I would have used it, regrettably, the doing business is not used as a conditionality. On the contrary, the bank is using conditionality on things that cannot even be measured. If they were to use the doing business as a conditionality, that would be fantastic. So uh, I, I disagree with, 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 that, with that part, because they are putting conditionalities on things that honestly either don't matter or you cannot measure them. Whereas creating jobs, opening your economy, private sector job creation, by the way, these are things that really benefit the people. So I would make it simpler rather than adding all of these flowers with probably one caveat. And I am the founding CEO of the Global Adaptation Institute, which has to do with issues related to climate change. And we develop an index which has an above 95 uh, point 95 correlation with the doing business in the index of economic freedom. And we make the data available. It's an open source. The data is available to everybody so you can slice and dice the information. So if you are El Salvador or Tanzania or Mozambique and you want to, you know, uh, work with the data and, and see what this means exactly for you or how you can uh, use that for whatever purpose you want to use it, uh, that would be something that I would be, you know, encouraging to, to do. But I wouldn't be thinking of too many bells and whistles, but rather keep it simple. Keep it simple. Thank you. Um, I don't know if any of the panelists want to add uh, about the future, but I wanted to just have one last question to Rita, so you're in the, the audience, but um, the Chilean controversy, how, how, what steps are, is the World Bank taking towards, you know, the methodological changes, and could you uh, speak to, to that, to that um, particular case? Um, there's a mic, um, Isabel, a mic for Rita. <laughs> I can start with this one okay. and then once I get the other one, I can thank you. <laughs> So uh, the, um, the bank is doing a few things. So there was the article, as uh, Justin mentioned, in the Wall Street Journal by Paul Romer, who was the f former chief economist of the bank, um, where he had you know, two main points. One was that uh, methodology changes were politically motivated. And OK, thank you. And the uh, other one was uh, some lack of transparency around the methodology changes and the comparability of the rankings. So he did retract the, uh, the point about um, uh, the um, political motivation of changes. And as I explained, the changes were driven mainly by the uh, panel review and by technical discussions within the bank. So there was no political I interference in any way. And also, in part, it's also 
that uh, reveals a little bit of lack of knowing the process of how we do methodology changes in any indicator because until you collect the data, you don't know what's going to happen. So it's actually <laughs> really much you're stepping in the dark and you're trying to find your way. So until you actually have the data, as to some extent, as Michael said, until we had the data, we did not know how it correlates with outcomes, how it, so it's all of these things, it's very hard to predict what will be the impact on the ranking, especially when we do methodology changes across it, so many indicators at the same time. So, uh, so even if, we, if there was an interest in favoring any country, it wasn't possible to, to do that a priori. Um, and then uh, the issue of the uh, transparency, I think that it's something that to, uh, the bank is looking into and trying to understand it better. So we do provide comparable rankings when there is uh, big methodology changes. So throughout those three years of, me uh, of methodology changes, we did have the previous year under the same methodology so people can actually isolate the change that was due to methodology and the change that was due to actually improvements in the country. Uh, so that was uh, made clear, but I think uh, there was the, the bank saw that there's, uh, that this was to some extent actually an opportunity to look at how can we do this better. And so even though it was clear that bank management stood by doing business and said there's no problem with the data, there's no question of integrity of the data of doing business or any other data set of the bank, there was an interest of starting an audit that focuses on the Chile data because the, the question was raised on Chile. But I think probably the more value added of the audit would be to look at our processes. What can, like, if we are to have future methodology changes, what should our, be our process? How can we better communicate those changes? What, um, and make it probably more inclusive to some extent. Uh, but in that, that audit is ongoing now, so I think we're expecting the results by June, July, so then at that point, once there are results, they would be made available to the public. Um, but I think the focus will be more on these issues of uh, going forward, if there are methodology changes, or how can we better present the information to uh, stakeholders, um, and less about what is the, the past. It's more a forward-looking uh, type of assessment. Thank you. Thank you. So now we have uh, some minutes for Q&A from, from uh, the public. So please, uh, there's a mic there. Uh, just state your name and affiliation. The lady here at the front. And then, did you raise your hands? The lady in the back? Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Rosemary Seguero. I'm a president of Seguero's International Group. We focus on small, global, small and medium SMEs. I'm a frequent attendee of the World Bank annual spring meetings. In fact, one of my paper was on small and medium businesses. Looking at your presentation, I looked somehow SMEs. Are SMEs part of uh, the businesses? Because SMEs around the world have not been much considered as small businesses, while they are the growth of, growth of and development of countries. Do you have the indicators, uh, the indi indicators, uh, data, and uh, policy on SMEs and how SMEs are treated in these countries? Looking at what you are saying, like I come from Kenya. Kenya is one of the digital advanced country even around the world. So how do we incorporate uh, SMEs into actual business? Even in the pitting, if we go for the actual pitting of uh, uh, companies, <coughs> SMEs are not even there. They don't even know what pitting is, and they are companies. So how do you make this happen to the SMEs, or how can you put data? We have put our own global SME data, and uh, we visit countries looking at how can big companies work with small companies for them to grow because the SMEs are the biggest and the growth of countries. So do you have that data and uh, uh, indicators and the challenges, problems or the impact looking at what we are talking here? It's business. So small woman, gender or whatever is a company. So how do you incorporate them into the indicators and how can they work with big companies, especially when it comes to PITS? Have you ever looked at that, or is only me working on that globally? Thank you. Another question in the back? Yep. 
Hi, uh, Anastasia De Santos with USAID. Uh, we're really glad to be supporting the bank in, in um, potentially adding that building a digital economy indicator. So I have a question for Rita and then a question for the panel. I'll start with a question for Rita is, in terms of the other potential new indicator, have you thought about broadening it more to something like competition policy to really think about how that affects different types of firms? And I think procurement is probably one aspect of that. And for the whole panel, in your uh, experience and also looking at global evidence, do you think that there are other regulatory issues that would affect the growth of SMEs, maybe not so much starting, but for them growing, whether or not they're formal? Okay, so we'll, um, the first question was on the data for SMEs and I guess maybe enterprise surveys and how they interact with uh, big companies. So I don't know if anybody wants to uh, answer that. And then the second question is about the expansion of, of the indicators. Um, so. I don't know, Rita or Michael. Okay. On first, just a little, just a personal take from what I have, do you have in my mind. On expansion of data first and then SMEs. Mm -hmm. uh, on expansion of data, I would think uh, there are 5,000 things that one could do, you know, lots and lots of extra indicators, and one needs to be a little careful about how far to go. Uh, integrity of the existing data is priority number one, making it understandable, simplify, et cetera, keep it not too di difficult, uh, keep those changes of methodology to a minimum. I think that would be the first order of the day. Uh, and then expanding. If one moves into expanding, one thing I would personally think to be keep in mind is to look at what the OECD does with its product market regulation indicators. The OECD product market regulation indicators are in spirit and in a way the methodology is used very similar to doing business. And if one goes into that direction, then there's another database to, to orient oneself by and to, to, to move with uh, rather than going into all the 14,500 areas of regulation that one could possibly cover. Uh, on SMEs, the thing that comes to mind in, in response to your question, is there a data set that measures all of what you say? No. Uh, is there, can the doing business type data help in, elucida in elucidating some of it? Yes. Uh, for example, one of the big issues is always access to credit to SMEs. No? How easy is it to, to get access to credit? And all sorts of governments have special SME programs. Many governments have hundreds of them. Uh, and the question, how effective is this? And what really drives the access to credit to SMEs? And in the research department, ASLI's work and so on, Try, basically shows in, in their two international studies and they suggest that um, if you improve access to credit regulation like the one captured in doing business, et cetera, that over time is more effective than special programs. So that's a, a concrete use of the, type, of the type of data that you're doing business supplies for SMEs. Uh, so regarding SMEs, I mean, I, I guess the, uh, as Rita mentioned, the ranking or the, all the indicators are based on a specific case, and that is an SME. So they actually are capturing, I guess, SMEs, not necessarily larger firms. So I guess the procedures may be different for other types of firms, although they're likely to be correlated with each other. Um, in general, I think it's hard to get um, data on SMEs. I mean, I've recently worked on a project with IFC where so they, they, there is an effort to try to measure how many SMEs are there in each country, which even, even that is not always straightforward because the data just doesn't always exist. And there was an effort to measure sort of what's the gap in financing that SMEs are demanding that is currently unmet. So there are efforts to measure um, issues specific to SMEs. They're not always um, easy to do or successful because there, there is not, not, the data is just not available. But um, I, I think from sort of the literature, um, a lot of the studies that look at reforms of things that are measured by doing business, especially in the getting credit area, tend to show that effects are greater for the smaller types of firms um, because I think they face greater constraints in part and, and they have a harder time dealing with this regulation because they just don't have the capacity. Um, so I think that's, and, and this issue of linking 
large and small firms. I think that the World Bank, I mean, there are currently a lot of projects that look at what they call, I guess, productive or just production chains and sort of productive alliances, things like that. So there are efforts to look at what can large firms do to um, sort of help promote the development of smaller firms in part uh, through technology, through platforms where they register uh, receivables and things like that. So there are efforts to work on, on these issues. So I think there's a, a couple of things on that. One, um, as I think uh, Romina already mentioned, there's this data set called Enterprise Service that looks at data by f at firm level, and it does include some SMEs, but it won't capture, they won't have who are their clients or suppliers, so you won't be able to know if they're dealing with a larger company or with a smaller company. Um, but there is a lot of work being done at the bank on value chain. So how do you sell to another company and how, like, so from the beginning until the product actually makes it to the final consumer, what is the process and what are the things that are breaking the, the chain? So what are the, the obstacles at the different chains? Um, but I don't think there is a cross-country data set that consistently measures it uh, that way. I think there, there would be more country-specific studies. I'm not sure if there's anything specifically on Kenya. And then on the expansion, I, I totally agree with Michael in the sense that, yes, there is, uh, there's many other areas that we can measure, and I think ideally if we could, <laughs> that would be great. But uh, the, the indicator or the, the whole report would always be um, a limited view of reality because that's, to some extent what's possible and that's also what's its goal. So I think the important thing is to keep in mind uh, that doing business is about business regulations that affect small and medium sized companies. Of course competition law can also affect small and medium sized companies but oftentimes it's more linked towards the largest ones. So it's more antitrust re regulations and our collision regulations. Um, so that's why it hasn't actually ever been really studied as part of doing business, although the bank does do work on that. But as part of doing business, we haven't really considered it yet. More questions? The gentleman here and the gentleman in the back. Oh, sorry. Ken Nibayashi from the Embassy of Japan, and thank you for the discussion. And I have two questions. One is about the uh, uh, application, and one is about gender gap. So the first question is about application. Uh, I understand the same methodology is applied to all 190 countries, uh, but each country has uh, different circumstances. For, exam for example, if you take uh, trading across borders, uh, countries that are surrounded by the sea will be ranked lower by uh, you know, countries with um, uh, never in country, uh, country, country borders. So do you think that the methodology should be tailored to each country's uh, individual circumstances or not? This is my f first question. And uh, secondly, uh, Rita showed uh, in her presentation that uh, uh, gender gap has been uh, inclu included in uh, doing business uh, from 2017. But do you think it is a good idea I mean, gender, I know gender gap is a huge issue, but uh, uh, is it, uh, should it be included in doing business? I mean, uh, if so, suppose there are two countries that are exactly uh, identical except for gender gap. So in country A, everyone is equal, and there's no gender gap issue, and in country B, there's a gender gap issue, it doesn't have to necessarily have to be a women's issue. It could be that uh, uh, men have you know, less access to capital, for example. But uh, for, for whatever reason, there's a gender gap in country B. And, but the average in, uh, index, index is exactly the same for two countries. So in this case, do you think that the country A should be ranked higher than uh, country B, and why? This is my second question. Thank you. 
big support of doing business when it was starting up and still, but also recognizing its limitations. Um, there was a short article in The Economist a week or so ago about the persistent uh, large size of informal economies in Latin America. They didn't present data, and they didn't talk about the rest of the world, but it led me to ask, is there a way to stand back after 15 years of doing business and say, is there some way to look at the global impact of doing business? I would think if there was one, it might be a declining share of informality and in overall economic uh, activity around the world. And I'm just wondering whether anybody has, has looked at that or asked the question about what is the overall global impact as opposed to country by country and rankings. Okay. So the gentleman question about computation and the gender gap, um, probably Rita, you, your best to answer that. And then, yeah, the, the studies on the, the effect of doing business on informality. Mm -hmm. so, um, so on the trading across borders specifically, the way we look at it, it's not about um, what is the country's reality, is this country different than another, it's thinking from the entrepreneur perspective. So if I'm an entrepreneur um, in, uh, say, in Japan, and I'm exporting to China, for instance, so we look at what is the most common trade partner, which I think in the case of Japan was China, if I'm not mistaken. Um, we look at from the perspective of that entrepreneur, is it harder or easier? So if he has to go through the port while, say, an uh, entrepreneur in France is exporting to Germany, which is just crossing the border, so then it's a much easier process. So it's not, it's less about what are the country characteristics, because there are other countries that, for instance, in Germany, that it actually exports to the US, so the most common trade partner is the US. So then, we're, even though it, it does ha border eight countries, how many countries does Germany border? I think eight countries. But uh, it actually, in there, we're measuring the port. So we're measuring the port of Hamburg, uh, not the actual frontier. So it depends a lot of what is the most common case that the entrepreneur would face, and not necessarily the geography of the country, because the object of study is the entrepreneur. On the issue of gender, what we added are really basic um, human rights issues, almost. Uh, so it's not about if there's a gender gap. So we don't actually look if there are more women entrepreneur or if women have more or less access to finance than men. What we're looking specifically there is, can a woman start a business the same way as a man? So in some countries, which is very few actually, there's only 20 or so countries where this is a problem, the, the process for a woman is more complicated than for a man because it involves things like getting the husband's permission so that the woman doesn't have legal independent enti entity to actually start her own business without a man signing a paper and saying, yes, you can do it, as opposed to a man can do it without ha asking for a, a, a woman's permission. So that's really the basic type of thing. And in Japan, none of those things are a problem. So there isn't an issue. So the, this is really basic type of rules that only a few countries still have to work on it to actually uh, make it equal between men and women. So that's why we included it, because it's something that it was important to actually show that in this country, the reality that a woman faces is different. When, you know, if you're a woman entrepreneur, you have a, a much more complicated process than a, a man. Um, let's just highlight that. And on the question of the informal sector, I think one of the main issues of measuring that is the lack of data on the informal sector, because since the informal sector is not registered, is hiding, it's relatively hard to measure uh, that sector in a consistent way. But I definitely think that is a very important aspect. What, what we have done is to some extent, or has been done, uh, it's the actual opposite of looking, has the formal sector increased? So it's not necessarily, has the informal reduced because that's harder to measure, but have we seen more firms being created? So, and that's how we would, to some extent, address the fact that there is a shift in the percentage of formal versus informal, but I'll let you add if you want to add anything to that point. Yeah, the data measurement on informal sector sucks, no? <laughs> uh, there is Mr. Schne Professor Schneider from the University of Linz who dominates uh, every estimate and it's all over the place and uh, wild guesswork. So I think the strategy that uh, Rita outlined to measure whether doing business reforms are associated with the cr more creation of formal firms is the only thing you can really do. 
Uh, at the same time, I would be even more aggressive in, in the light of what you said, Stephen. Um, doing business actually measures what is most important for government policy making on the informal sector. It doesn't measure what's happening in the informal sector, but if government thinks about what to do about the informal sector, there are two things you can do. You can either try and harass everybody and say you shouldn't be informal. Uh, that's not a very good solution. Uh, or you'd make it easier to be formal and lower the costs of formality and increase the benefits of formality. And that's what doing business is about. So in, in spirit, but showing that through measurement of the informal sector and what happened in the informal sector is, is unless Mr. Schneider has some serious competition and somebody comes up with a new methodology, I think it's not going to happen. Yeah, I just... <laughs> I want to kind of predictably push back on the idea of evaluating doing business too much on its usefulness for policymakers or on what it's accomplished, whether in terms of maybe reducing, uh, I'd be agnostic as to whether doing business has contributed to a reduction in informality globally. Um, I think the bank has to make a decision about whether it wants this to be a really useful marketing and political tool for operations or whether it wants to defend the intellectual integrity of the product. I mean, when I started to complain online about some of like, the misrepresentation of the changes in India's ranking and doing business, I got actual responses from people which were quite clever saying, look, India is one of the largest bank borrowers with the most poor people in the world. For the good of the world, the bank should exaggerate India's doing business ranking and encourage foreign direct investment in India. That would be a responsible use of the doing business indicators. Let's promote FDI in India, make sure India looks good, boost the current government, promote investment. That's a path I don't think we want to go down. I don't think we want to get too much into this conversation. If it's been really useful for policy reform, it's really helped us achieve our policy objectives. I, don't know. I mean, I think the research department needs to step back and say, do we believe in the methodology? Are we doing this rigorously? Are we doing this carefully? Can we convince our research colleagues that we're doing this right and try to insulate itself from the World Bank operations as much as possible? That was the whole idea of moving doing business from IFC to the research department in the first place, and I hope they continue to operate in that spirit. Comment on that. I just, I, one, one very general comment, but I think it does uh, refer to your India, exa uh, uh, it does refer to your India example, is that uh, of the usage of DB by uh, investors, and especially foreign investors or, or any investor in general, I think this is just one data point of many. And, you know, and investors are not stupid, otherwise they wouldn't be successful investors. So just uh, the whole idea of the bank hyping up the, the score of India to attract investment, that doesn't make any sense just because then the, invest, the investor knows India. No one's going into India without being on the ground, knowing how it is, and knowing all the problems. They probably know it better than we do. <laughs> um, so to have that idea that this would attract more investment, it just, it's just very odd. Like, it's just undermining the intelligence or underestimating the intelligence of the investors, in my view. Uh, and the Sorry. Indians. And the intelligence of the Indians. Mm. <laughs> Come on. You know that the bank statements to the Indian press about the doing business increase are false. Right? We've had email exchanges about this. The numbers that are in the press release are false. The statements by the country director about this is all based on ground realities from the small and medium enterprises are false. Like, it is an insult to the Indian public because what the country office is saying is not true. Okay, are there any last minute questions? If not, I'm going to thank um, Juan Jose, Justin, Miriam, and Michael, and Rita for, for the event, and um, please, a, a round of applause for them.